This interview is being conducted on April 21st, 2005 at St. Andrew Life Center in Niles, Illinois. My name is Kate Wallachie. I am speaking with Mr. Edward Hawker. Mr. Hawker was born in 1924 in Ypsilanti, Michigan, and now lives in Niles, Illinois. He is a veteran of the Second World War and the Korean War. Mr. Hawker learned of the Veterans History Project through, do you have a poster? Uh, there was a big poster on the bulletin board. Uh, through the poster from the Niles Public Library. Yeah. He has kindly <laughs> consented to be interviewed for the project. Here is his story. So we'll start way at the beginning, but if you want to talk about other things as you go along, we don't have to stick to any sort of... Well, detail. should I start at the beginning of where I got interested in the Navy? Yeah. Okay. I uh, graduated from high school in uh, 1942, uh, and the war was going on, so we knew we'd have to be, they'd be taking us sooner or later. And um, I was planning on going to college. I um, took uh, an exam for a scholarship to the University of Illinois. Uh, among the eight young men taking it, I got first place. So, well, I don't know how what theirs were. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I got a scholarship to the College of Agriculture. I was living, this was when we were living down, my parents were living in Piatt County. And uh, my dad had to drive all over the county to get signatures for me I, to take the t exam. Took the exam, then I <clears throat> got the scholarship, and I enrolled at the University of Illinois. Um, I took the physical exam and passed it, and so I had to be in the ROTC. Well, I, after a week in the Army ROTC, I didn't want any of that in uh, World War II. So when they had the Navy around getting people to sign up, I signed in De yeah, December of 42, I signed up to join the Navy. And so uh, June 1st, 1943, I, uh, they called me up and I had to go to Purdue University. They had to, you had to have two years of uh, college education to be able to go to Midshipman School. So I had, uh, went to Purdue, we always called it Schmurdu, <laughs> and uh, They'll leave that out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, took the year. The only thing that was hard about it was I had to take two semesters of physics. The math wasn't bad. and uh, I majored in uh, biological science and physical science, but I didn't like to take, I knew I had to take chemistry just for my major, but I knew I didn't, I didn't know I had to take uh, physics for the Navy, what good that was. And <laughs> then when the second semester I had to take engineering drawing and the poor professor at the end of the semester said, you have flunked this course worse than any <laughs> student I ever had. <laughs> like what we had to do now, draw not only the front of this, but the back of this without turning it around or anything. And, but it didn't mean anything. You had to take the course, but it didn't mean anything. But he, he was disappointed. <laughs> so I, uh, I made it through the year. And one reason of that was that in math, the professor was grading on the curve. I got B's and C's in college algebra, in um, uh, 
geometry and trigonometry, stuff I'd never heard of before, <laughs> but because he graded on the curve. And so almost, almost everybody passed, but those that were really bad in math, they didn't pass. And I thought I was going to be one of them, <laughs> but I wasn't, I made it. Then we had, in algebra, we had two guys from Tennessee that uh, they couldn't understand what X times Z or whatever it was. I don't know now. Uh, so the professor told, okay, I got a field that's this long, this wide. How do I find how many acres I have in it? They said, well, you just multiply he said, okay, this is X times Y. That's the basis of algebra. Well, he, now he taught them, yeah. but it wasn't that hard for me, I know, because I'd had uh, high school algebra. And uh, then when we got out of, finished the year there, orders to go to Notre Dame to midshipman school. How come they sent you to Purdue in particular? What? Was there a reason that they sent you to Purdue as because opposed the, to something else? the Navy else? had a school there. Oh. They had uh, uh, to, they picked Purdue to take the, the people in, uh, that was entered the Marines and the Navy that had one year, of, a minimum of one year of college, then they, they took the, those in there for, from the Midwest. We couldn't, see the, they took a whole bunch of the football team of all things from Illinois, and that year Illinois lost and Purdue won. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't see why they didn't beat us in <laughs> Illinois. <laughs> and we got through and went up to, um, I took the electric uh, train from home. It was a quarter of a mile from us, so I could easily take it to Danville. The first thing I did when I got off the train was they said, you cannot walk the streets uh, if you're going in the Army or Navy because uh, Danville is out of uh, you just, the streets weren't open to military personnel because of some, they'd been in trouble or something, I don't know. They said, get to the hotel and stay there hmm. overnight. I said, okay. I didn't know Danville anyway. So the next morning I took, caught the train to uh, Chicago. This was at, yeah, Chicago and stayed overnight with my brother, oldest brother that was living in Chicago. And then I took the train to South Bend. And boy, we got the button then. Fall in! <laughs> and um, took us to Notre Dame, and the section that they had for midshipman school. And that took uh, July, August, September, October, the last week in October, we graduated. And um, it was tough. It was tough. And uh, uh, all my relatives were saying, oh, he'll make it, oh, he's my, uh, except for one cousin who was married to a guy that was in the Navy. And she said to my mother, Aunt Bridge, don't listen to them. He is going to have, he may make it, but he's going to have a hard time because their schools are not easy. And I did have. And I thought I was going to get kicked out because uh, after I, uh, you'd sit in class and you'd look straight ahead. And I knew my roommate was going to flunk out. He was very poor. 
but you sat alphabetically. So he was sitting right next to me, and when I got a page done, I just slid it over and st straight, <laughs> straight ahead. And if he got any of it, more power to him, but I don't know whether he did, because I couldn't look. If you were caught looking this way, boom, out. If you were caught looking that way, up at the teacher and down at your paper. That was only during the exam. And I don't know how he made it, but he flunked out. But uh, then they, they called me in the next day. Who was the teacher there? I don't know why they were doing it. And I didn't know his name. And so they said, OK, here's a lineup. Pick him out. Maybe, the, maybe he had seen me pushing the papers around. I don't know. But I couldn't pick him out. All right, go back to your room. And uh, I was expecting to get called up and say I was on my way to uh, Great Lakes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the next day they found the teacher that was in my classroom. And the teacher, I went into the office and the teacher said, yes, that's the one. And he recognized me and I was, so I went through. Why they did it, I have no idea. <laughs> How strange. Yeah. Whether they did it with other people just for testing them, I, uh, whether they had a whole bunch of people they wanted to test and see how they would react, I don't know. Huh. And uh, <clears throat> when we were, uh, we got enrolled and, and um, the beginning of the classes, the officer that was teaching navigation, he said, one thing I'm going to remind you of the very beginning. When you get through midshipman school, if you make it, you will have one gold stripe on your uniform. He said, you will be a dumb greenhorn. And you get aboard ship and you won't know damn thing about what you're doing. Depend on your crew. Make sure you get along with your crew. They can, and especially the, uh, the men that are second class, third class, and chief petty officer. And I made a point of that because I didn't know the first thing about a ship. And uh, we had a very good first-class radio. We'd been out to sea for a while. We'd had, we were on our way to, we'd been through the Panama Canal. We were on our way to the Pacific. And uh, he came in one day uh, to my stateroom, knocked, came in and said, Mr. Hawker, I have to go up on the crow's nest. The radio antenna isn't working and I have to go up and fix it. I said, well, go up. He said, but I'm afraid to. <laughs> I, I said, okay, go up and get all your tools ready and I'll be up there in a few minutes. And I sat there and what the hell? <laughs> well, I guess I'll have to be a strong person. I went up there and I said, okay, you got your bag of tools. You start up and I will be right behind you. Do not look down, do not look up, look straight out at the horizon. And he went up and I went up after him and he got in the crow's nest and started working. I had to, there was only room for one person, so I had to hang on to the railing of the ladder and uh, hang there for a while. And pretty soon he was done, I, he said, I'm done. And he didn't act scared at all. And uh, I said, okay, I will go down first. Don't look down, don't look up, look straight out. And we got down and I was as calm as could be. And he was all chipper and everything. And I thought, boy, did he pull his a leg on me? And, but he didn't, I found out. He was scared until I came up and went up with him. And then everything just 
left. The fear left. But when I was going down the ladder to my stateroom, I was la, 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 la. <laughs> I was shaking like that. So when did you, you, you went through midshipman school, and then when did you um, end up on the ship? Well, when we got through midshipman school, we went to Norfolk and uh, Camp Bradford. And there we took training in the field that we were going to be in. I was in communication, so I had to take, uh, we were there, we got there in around the first, we had two weeks of leave, so it was in November. And we had until after Christmas. And then we, uh, studying whatever field you were in, I was in communications. Um, then we went up to Boston, where our ship was being built, right at, shortly after Christmas in January. And they can keep Boston in the winter time. <laughs> I had to go out and buy a pair of overshoes that came up almost to my knees. So much snow, more than any than, than in the Midwest. And uh, I was put in charge of the troops that stayed in uh, Boston, and the rest of them went out, the ones that were needed on the ship before it was commissioned went out there, and I was responsible for them. So when I uh, checked their bunks and all and saw that they were all present, I had nothing to do for the rest of the day unless they'd call me and say, uh, <clears throat> put an order in for this and this, and I had to take care of ordering things and see when they came in. So I made it to uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's home, and all. I had about a half day that there was, uh, they, the men were in class. I was, had done the paperwork that I was supposed to do, and, taking care of any order, so I was free to go explore the t city. And uh, then in, let's see, that was January, February, March, April about, we were commissioned. Everybody went out to the ship and we had the ceremony and we were commissioned and we took off for Chesapeake Bay where we were gonna do our shakedown. What does that mean? Uh, well, you take and you put the ship through all its maneuvers that you can think of to see if everything is okay. And it was. <clears throat> that was about a week, five days or so. Then we went into Norfolk and tied up to the pier and supplied our ship, uh, our food, our this and all that that we had. Then we went up to New York. We were going to load up. But we did. I didn't know, and most of the officers did not know what we were going to be loaded up with. We were load, I was on an LST, a landing ship tank, and the whole body of the ship was just a big tank. We loaded up with beer, <laughs> <laughs> taking it to Hawaii, to Honolulu, to the Navy base. And when we got out to, we then when we loaded up, we went down to Cuba, uh, Guantanamo, Gitmo. And uh, we could not go off of the base. We couldn't see any of Cuba. Then we were there for a day or two days. Yeah. And uh, Everybody got sick on the ship going down there because somehow some formaldehyde got broken in sick bay and got spread all through the ventilating system. And uh, everybody that had never been to sea got seasick and some of those, did. I was, oh God, I was sick. I could eat crackers and pickles. That was the only thing I could eat. I'd heave everything up over the side. 
<laughs> Except for the crackers and the pickles. What? Except for the crackers and the pickles. Yeah. Sounds like you're a pregnant lady. I know. <laughs> But, uh, but there was a lot of people that couldn't eat anything. They were sick. Was there something, did you eat in a, like a mess hall or did you eat no, together? No, we, we were in the officer's oh, mess. Oh, that's right, I'm sorry. Oh, God, oh. no, oh, So my. what did you get, what was there to eat? And were... almost everybody was sick except the skipper and the exec. They had had duty uh, before we did and they were uh, not sick, but Every one of the green ensigns was sick, some worse than others. I was really bad. And uh, two or three days, and then it just we hit the Gulf Stream, and it was as calm as could be, so we were, we were cured. And then we spent a day or two at uh, Gitmo. Then we went through the Panama Canal. And when we got through it, we, for some reason, we stayed in the sit town or whatever it was, the base, on the west side for a while. For two, or two days, I guess, or three days. And um, I wasn't able to go ashore. Well, the ones that went ashore were officers that were a little older than I was and had, had military police duty. They were patrolling the houses of prostitution. <laughs> so they weren't having a good time either. <laughs> and some of the guys uh, got, I don't know what they ate, they were sick. They came back and they were drunk. And it was a mess, a mess but the skipper and the exec expected this, so it didn't bother them too much. And the next day we hauled out for Pearl Harbor. And we were, um, well, it took a while for us to cross. And there was quite a few, the exec was Catholic and I was Catholic, and there was quite a few of the enlisted men were Catholic. And so we hadn't been to Mass for two or three, a month or two. And uh, so he went ashore and arranged for a chaplain to come out. Then he got, told me, you get a crew and uh, set up an altar on the tank deck when they get the beer taken off. <laughs> <laughs> well, they told us when they saw all the beer, they, they said, you weren't supposed to get out here with all of this. Take about a hundred cases and make it disappear. Yeah. <laughs> so the captain put them in a storage room. And um, uh, I was helping uh, this, uh, I got this Italian guy the, aboard ship that he and I were buddies and I got him to help me. And he said, hey, Mr. Hawker, where are the rest of the damn dagos? And I said, wait a minute, you're not supposed to use that term. <laughs> he said, you can't. I'm a, I'm a Dago, I can use it. <laughs> Where are the, those damn lazy, dumb Dagos? I said, well, they didn't come down. Well, you better go and get them. And I, so I went up and got a couple of them. But I got, that's the first time I learned that you could not, uh, use the slang except for your own nationality. Now, I could call somebody a limey because I was half English and a shanty Irish because my mother was Irish, but I could not call a Polak, a, a nigger, or a Dago, any of that. I never knew that. I thought it was, uh, we were raised that none of those terms <laughs> you could use, none. Were there a lot of people from different ethnic backgrounds on the ship with you? Did you meet people from other um, places in the country? Well, the exec was Irish. The captain was English. I was English-Irish. There was a t some Italians, there were blacks, there were Filipinos. And then there were just white people that I don't know what they're 
I, I could tell in Italian that there weren't any Polish, there weren't any Lithuanians. They were from, most of them were from the East Coast, so whatever that was. And, uh, Was it different for you? Did you meet people that you hadn't you hadn't known before? Did you meet? Oh, a lot I of people? was a country boy, and almost all of them were city slickers. <laughs> but uh, we got along fine. I uh, I got along better with the enlisted men than the officers because they were, I thought, a little bit of this. There was one that um, he stood in front of the mirror <laughs> and tripped his hair and all. He was from Los Angeles, hoity-toity. And uh, there was another one from Texas. And he had beautiful blonde hair. And he would primp it and all. And he had a Texan's flag. And he hung it in his room, and somebody who did it, nobody ever knew. I did not know. They took it from his stateroom and hung it over a toilet in the bath. He was, oh, he was highly insulted. Well, he was such a, oh, he thought Texas was absolutely wonderful and was the perfect place. And he put too much emphasis on that. And uh, somebody just, I, one of the officers, but it wasn't me because he was my roommate and I didn't dare, <laughs> but I didn't even think of it. But who did it, I don't know. Were, did you just have one roommate or did you, were you? No, how we many just people? had two. Uh, it, the, each stateroom could handle four, but there wasn't any need of it because they had enough staterooms for two. Uh, there was uh, one from Northern New York State. There was one from San Francisco. There was, let's see, one, two. There was myself, the guy from Texas, the guy from California, five, and then the skipper and the exec. And uh, there was two more. There was about seven officers aboard, six or seven. And uh, and how many enlisted men? With six or seven officers, how many enlisted men do you know? We had somewhere around 300. Wow. Well, it was an LST, and they had a, a good-sized crew. Two, two to three hundred, somewhere in there. You have to have uh, so many, well, okay, I had uh, communications. I had the radarman and the signalman and the radioman. So there would be, there was about four radarmen and one, two, three, four, about five radiomen and four signalmen. So that was right there, that was a, a bunch. And then you had the same uh, quartermasters, you had uh, uh, yeomen, you had, uh, uh, what did they call them? They were, they handled the money and the cash and that, I don't know what the term was, I don't recall. And then you had to have a big flock of just plain seamen. And you had uh, bosun's mates and all that, and engineers and all. So it didn't take long to get up to between two and three hundred enlisted men. And every time we went out to sea, I was seasick. <laughs> and I'd be sitting I'd eat dinner by myself out on the fan tail and up chuck everything. <laughs> and uh, once we got out to sea about three days, I was fine. 
you could be out there for six months and I'd never get seasick. But if I went into the port and we were tied up and didn't go out for a week or two, I'd be as sick as could be when I went out. And then I'd get over it. And uh, we went to, we were out on the Gilbert Islands, all those islands through there on the way to uh, Guam, uh, the Gilberts, and uh, the Marshall Islands. And uh, then we got to uh, Guam and Saipan. And we were. Uh, you weren't holding beer anymore. You didn't have. You weren't filled with beer anymore. But you didn't oh, have I didn't any. drink it. No, well, no, no. The, but we had our hundred bo uh, boxes, <laughs> cases of it. Still there. And at three o'clock every day, until it was gone, it was knock <laughs> off work, beer down. <laughs> Everybody got two bottles of beer. So when you left Pearl Harbor and you were you were traveling, what were you what were you transporting or what were the you beer. still oh, the oh, beer? Pearl Harbor. No. After you left there, where oh, did no. you? Um, well, then we went. Back. Obviously, the beer was the most important part. We oh, we all course. understand that. Yeah. We went back to Seattle and we loaded up with. Um, LCM, uh, they were uh, small type of uh, some sort of a boat or something that, and we carried quite a few of them out and uh, uh, tanks out to Pearl Harbor again. We went up to Seattle and we were in there about a week and we loaded up with all this stuff and then we took off and went back out to uh, uh, Pearl Harbor and unloaded them and then from then on, no, we took them out to, uh, I think we did anyway, to uh, Guam and Saipan. We went out there and there we loaded up with dynamite. We were going into it real good. And we were up going on up to Okinawa. They were still fighting there. And uh, we got about, oh, I don't know how far out, and the engine, one of the engines conked out. So we had to come back. We accused the engineering officer of putting sand in them. <laughs> and uh, it delayed us. And by that time, they had, uh, we were back at, Pearl, at uh, Guam. We could see all these planes flying in and out of Tinian, and we wondered what they were while they were bombing Japan. And uh, Eno Enola Gay, Gray, who was the, ship, the plane that took the Nuki, mm -hmm. it was flying over, but we didn't, we didn't know it. We didn't know it. Oh, that was the tightest secret because I had a friend later on that had worked at the air base at Tinian and he said they didn't tell us a damn thing. We were just doing things and we didn't know why or what until the Enola Gray came back from their first bombing with a nuclear bomb. Then everybody knew it on uh, that island, but we didn't know it. We were just about 10 miles away on uh, Guam. We didn't know until after the war ended. But we had a big time when the war ended. When we got word that it ended, the skipper went ashore. Well, the exec got out all the beer, all the wine, all the booze that we'd had, and it was under lock and key. And everybody had a bit, and every ship in the harbor had a big time. And I understand they had some pretty good parties ashore. Yeah. And uh, then we went to uh, 
when uh, about a week after that, we went up to Okinawa. The, sh the engines had gotten fixed and we unloaded the dynamite and we were there for a while, quite a while. And this buddy of mine who was an enlisted mess uh, signalman, he and I went ashore and went into the, some of the caves. One of the dumbest things you could do because there might be still live Japanese there. But we didn't find any, <laughs> and we went up into the mountains. We took the jeep and went up into the mountains and all. We we saw it, and uh, when the I looked up a buddy of mine that was that I'd gone to high school with. He was in the army and he was on Okinawa, and. Uh, all you could get to drink there was coffee. <laughs> well, the Japanese didn't have any, you didn't want Japanese stuff. Ooh, boy, that was potent when you did get it. And uh, we were there for a while. And then the war was ended, so everything was settling down. And all of a sudden, we got middle of the night. We got a dispatch through, prepare to leave immediately, typhoon coming through. <gasps> well, I'd heard of typhoons, but I'd never had any, seen, been through one. And we were getting underway, and we were thought we were following this ship, but it was stationary, and it was loaded with uh, ammunition. And if we'd have ever hit it, Everything would have been blown up, but we discovered it was tied up, so we skirted around it and got out in the harbor and out of the harbor and start. You had to go straight south from Okinawa as fast as you could go, and you'd get out of the typhoon area. But man, when we came back and then we came. When the typhoon had passed, we came back and, man, that harbor was a mess. Every ship that couldn't get underway was up on the beach, on its side, on its back. And then there was a ship coming from Japan down that got caught in it. And it was a destroyer. It was split in half. Well, the half that had the uh, uh, engine and all that in it. They made that down to Okinawa. I don't know what happened to the other half, whether it f sunk and all, but that ship made it down there to Okinawa and they towed it back to the U.S. and put another half on it. Oh, we were experts in the Navy <laughs> at ashore and uh, more than once we uh, once we were in um, Guam, and we had to haul out at the drop of a hat to go. There was a uh, earthquake in Alaska. Now to see how far, and Guam is miles from Alaska. That, those waves were coming down so spon so fast and so spontaneous and high that any ship that could get underway, get out and head, head southwest. And uh, until you're ordered to come back. Boy, that was going. Uh, one of these, uh, like a, it would be something like a tsunami that was in the e there this last winter, something along that line. These waves would come. And, and uh, some of the ships that were tied up and couldn't get out were damaged, but it wasn't a real tsunami, but it was bad enough. Yeah. And uh, we got out of it. So when you were on ship, did you keep in touch with your family? Oh yeah, you'd, uh, every time you went into port, the I and the uh, mailman would have to go ashore with me with the sidearms on, but no bullets. We you just to had to look threatening, huh? <laughs> we, we laughed about that. 
what the hell good is the gun if you don't have any bullets? But it was, that was a rule. They knew the Japanese wouldn't, people wouldn't jump on us. They were peaceful, but you had to have it. And, uh, but we hadn't been up to Japan by then, but uh, they uh, were, uh, they sent us down to New Guinea to pick up uh, troops. We were, were supposed to go down to the Philippines for training to the invasion of Japan, but that was all over with. We went up to Japan and we were there for a few days and then we took off for uh, New Guinea. When we got down there, we had to load up with Air Force that were there. And um, it took a while and then we came back up to Japan. And when we got into Japan, we were the first ship to go into the harbor and tie up at a pier. Uh, before that, they stayed out in the harbor and anchored. Mm -hmm. But there was wonderful piers there, so we could go in. We were the first one to go in and tie up to the pier. Well, we found out why. They were going to work on our engines and our system and bring everything up to date and uh, that shut off the water supply and everything and toilets, there were no toilets aboard ship and we had to go down to one of the buildings on the pier and go in and use the Japanese toilet and it was nothing like an American. <laughs> it was a hole in the floor and you just squat down and do your duty. <laughs> uh, yeah. And every once a day, the doctor and his crew would have to come down and turn the hoses on to clean it, keep it sanitary. Once a day? Once a, uh, once a day. Well, there was a line of them, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, we had to go ashore to get water. We had to, there was no power. And we, we got power from the shore. From a, and uh, that was about four, about a week. And then we got our own supplies back. But there, um, the piers that the ship was in getting repaired was wonderful. They were up to date and the toilet was except that it was just, it was the wrong style. It was Japanese style, not American style. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, then we went up to, uh, well we'd been up to Japan. Yeah, we were in Japan then. And uh, we made, uh, that's where I decided I wanted, this ship that I was on the LS T-1062 was going, I don't know, it was going on some long trip and I didn't want it. So I put in a request to change ships and I got it. I got a flagship LST-775 and we were in either Guam or Saipan around Christmas time and uh, the uh, captain that was uh, head of the staff, he asked his doctor to go to the Protestant Christmas service to represent him. And he said, oh, I can't, I have to, I've been invited to go to the Catholic Mass. <laughs> and then he came and asked me, would it be okay if I went? And he told me why. I said, sure, come on. <laughs> and he said, why the hell should I go to the Protestant service when he doesn't go? Yeah. No way. He didn't. I gather that the staff did not like their commanding officer. The, uh, uh, it was the, well, 
they they had a duty of five ships or something and uh, the trouble was that they whoever was the skipper on there we had a a new skipper and I was new and all uh, had not kept the files had not kept the communication things they kept them and when they left I went into the file and my god we had uh, shortly after Christmas they left went back to the States they had uh, uh, this type of code and that kind of code not locked up or anything and that was one of the worst rules you could have so I called the uh, office ashore and said what am I going to do with them well take care of them. I said no I'm not going to touch them they're not locked they're open and all he said what I said yes he said bag them up bring them in to me so I bagged all the communication stuff up, took it into him, and he, they they went through it. I got the jeep and I drove into the base. They then they said, "Now we are going to take these codes and all and issue that they're all expired. We're going to issue them to you. Then you will legally be able to destroy them, take them, go through them, and burn every one of them." And I was glad that I, when that was over because you weren't supposed to, your codes and all were top, were at least secret. Two days of burning stuff, that was how old the stuff was. What have they been keeping it for? Oh, top secret, secret, confidential. When you were through with it, you burned it. It was strip codes. And you just tear them and put them in the fire, tear them and put them in the fire and burn them. And make sure that they were burned very easily. And uh, then I got uh, transferred to another ship. I had to go from Guam up to Saipan to catch it. How did and, you get there? Uh, in a, a, a small boat uh, and uh, that was going to, I don't know why, uh, why the 1062 was being where it was going but I didn't want to go with it and uh, we went, uh, got on the 775, yeah and uh, when we went, uh, left uh, Saipan, we were going, uh, we had government, Navy personnel that were legal beagles. They were setting up a government for, on the islands. So we went down to the Caroline Islands and um, got down there and we were there for a good while because we, uh, we had these government people and they had to go around to the different people and all and so we uh, the skipper didn't uh, that skipper didn't want to allow drinking aboard ship of any kind so we take put the small boat out in the water and whoever uh, two or three times I went with the crew aboard and those that were eligible for liberty got on and we put the beer in, went, went to one of the islands and sat there, did nothing but drink the beer and goof off and look around and then come back to the ship because it was against the rules to have uh, booze, drinking booze aboard ship. But when we were out at sea we did it because nobody could, would just know about it and the captain said, keep your mouths shut when you go ashore. <laughs> so we'd have two beers a day and I'd give my other two, my two, because I didn't drink beer to somebody else. And we had, we were there about, oh, three weeks. Yeah, on uh, this, I don't know what the name of it was, but it was uh, the Caroline Group.
and then they gave us a bunch of natives to take back to their islands that the Japanese had had there at the Carolines. And we put them on the tank deck and then we had to put a guard there to keep, see that they stayed there and see that nobody went down and molested them. And we had two Jesuit priests aboard. Uh, one was Spanish and one was American. We had picked him up at uh, Guam or Saipan, where he had come up. He had, he had been on uh, some islands where the uh, Japanese captured and they put him in prison. At, oh, Guam, it was Guam. And uh, he, he said, he wasn't sick all the time he, they were in prison. He felt fine. And uh, when he, the war ended, he said, send me back. I'm fine. I'm in good health. And he said he was, uh, two days later, he was walking down the dusty street on whatever island it was, and boom, he fell flat on his face, knocked out. And he had to be shipped back to um, Honolulu for medical care. And he said he had no, he was help, while he was in prison, he was helping other sick people and he never got sick and all of a sudden it hit him like that. And uh, he was on this ship, he was the American Jesuit that was on this ship and he was taking over from the Spanish Jesuits. And uh, they were in the stateroom right uh, like there was a wall here and I was in this one and I was, they were there. So when they'd wake up in the morning and go to say mass, I'd be uh, awake, I'd go in to attend mass with them. And uh, oh, he told all about how, he, oh, he had been in the Philippines, not Guam, he had been in the Philippines. And he said when they captured that, they put him in jail, prison. And he said he just passed out on the sand when he went back. And uh, finally, it was January of 46, by that time, January or February, we got back to Guam. We got all these people out on their islands and there was, they had, this one woman had been taken by the Japanese as a well, I guess a prostitute, I don't know. And she got pregnant. Well, the, her own people disowned her. They, uh, we had to put her, well, the, the government team that was with us had to put her, the people put her on an island separate from, there was a small little island. It had one coconut tree and some water, I don't know how they got the water, but they had one. She and her child had to stay on that. Now, how long, I don't know. We, we could do nothing. And the government at that time could do nothing. It was, they, they were just there to see that they didn't break any American laws or whatever, I don't know. But those natives, they put her on the island, they were gonna keep her there. Yeah, we thought even the crudest men aboard our ship thought it was awful. <laughs> but there was nothing we could do as a crew, as a ship. And I don't know whether the military officers were able to do anything over a period of time because they were going to stay there. I don't know. And when we got back to Guam and Saipan, we could, we could prepare to head back to the States. We had to tow another LST. And uh, we were towing them back. We were past Honolulu. That's where we had picked up the ship. We went to Honolulu, picked up the ship uh, that we were towing, and we were towing them back to the States. And in the middle of the night, the cables broke. Well, you try to get two ships tied up yeah. together in the middle of the night. We did it, but it was ungodly. 
and uh, we finally got to San Diego, got rid of the ship that we were towing, and then we had to take palm, uh, pontoons. They're big metal that they use for bridges, and we carried them tied to the side of a ship, one on each side, and we had to take them up someplace up the coast. And we got them up there, and we came back down, and uh, then we had to go up to San Francisco and decommission. Hey, we were going home. Uh, it was, and we got up to San Francisco and we decommissioned the ships, and they were all set to go, and we went ashore. And uh, we were there for about a week while they got the papers and everything. And we uh, got on the train and took off. <laughs> and I went to Chicago and uh, stayed at my uh, a cousin overnight. And then I had to take the train up to Great Lakes and got discharged. Then I took him, uh, the train down to Paxton and my mother and a neighbor, I called or, yeah, called and told or sent a telegram or something that I would be in the train at a certain time. So my mother brought this, or this neighbor brought my mother in to pick me up. And uh, I was back. And then July, this was in June, July 1st, I got a letter from the Navy saying that I had been promoted to Lieutenant J.G., and I was going to just forget it. My sister, who was, had been married to an Army officer, and he had died of cancer. For, they had lived in Spokane. She said, you go get it. It'll, it's important for you, and it'll be good for you. So I said, how am I going to get down there? I'll take you down there, and, and to, uh, took us down, me down to Champaign-Urbana to the armory, and I went in and got promoted. And it came in handy later, but but my tour was over, so uh, that was ends. It two well, years long was your tour. How long was your tour? Do you know? I was in the Navy from '43 to July 1st, '46. It's a long time. Well, my brother was in the uh, brother was in the army from. January of 42 to sometime in 46. And my other brother, the oldest brother, the one that had the broken neck, he got taken in after I did. And I don't know how, he was home when I got home, so I don't know how long he was, uh, he was up here in Chicago then. So I don't know how long he was in, but he was in for two years, I guess. But he worked at prison camps. So that ends World War II. So did you stay in the military in between World War II and Korea, or were you, did you do something else in between? Oh, no, I didn't stay in the Navy. I was, went reservist, and I went back to college and finished college and started teaching school. <laughs> oh, I had my heart set on school. Oh, the first school I taught at, 20, 20 or 25 young girls had to quit because they were pregnant. Oh my goodness. The next school I taught at, some boys had gonorrhea. And the town, about eight miles away, they had more damn gonorrhea than Carter has pills. They almost had to call the Call, close the school and get medical care in. It was horrible. And I quit teaching and my, I was married then and my wife and I moved up back up to Chicago. She was from Chicago. And now, now do I have to start on the uh, Korean? You can if you want to. Okay, well I want to tell both. Oh, good. And uh, so in I was working at Armors. I enjoyed the work, and uh, you'd 
have to on Mondays you'd have to work long hours because you have to get all the or, orders in and all the uh, reports in and count this and count this number of hams and count this number of pigs coming through to be butchered at all and then and then on Saturday you had to work a half a day so you timed yourself so that uh, some Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, I could get off anywhere from noon to two, three, four o'clock. But on Monday, you had to work till about eight or nine, and sa Saturday, you had to work a half a day. So you had your other days short. And uh, I'd come home from work, and my wife said, "Hey, you get," uh, and when the uh, Korean War had started. My wife would say, oh, you got the uh, orders, and she, I'd say, throw it in the f furnace. <laughs> she said, okay, and I came home this one day, November of 51, and I, she pulled that on me, and I said, I'll burn it. She said, oh, no, I'm not. This is a real thing. I said, what? Yeah. December 1st, I have to report for duty in Astoria, Oregon. So uh, I went to work and I found out that if I was uh, went in the service, my job would be held safe. That was the way it was then. I don't know how it is now. I guess it still is, yeah. And uh, so uh, two weeks before I had to go, I had, had to quit because I had to go to up to Great Lakes and down town to the Navy office there for different things. I had to go up to Great Lakes to get, first I had to go to uh, the office downtown and it was November and it was cold and it, the streets were icy in Chicago. They didn't have them clear then <laughs> and this one I was going up a hill and I couldn't make it. I finally made it. and. Uh, I had to go in and sign this and sign that. And then I had to go up to um, Great Lakes and get, they had changed uniforms. Uh, we had gray uniforms in World War II. We had gone back to the khaki and the navy blue uniforms. So I had to get all new uniforms. And uh, then December, I left on the 29th or 30th of December to get out to Astoria, Astoria on the 1st, and my son was just one year old. And uh, my wife was living, we were living with my in-laws, and uh, got on the train and went out there and uh, we, uh, we were living on the base then. I don't know why they had us out there. Oh, we, were, we had to appear on the ship every day and do work. That was it. And uh, boy, was there drinking there <laughs> one day. I don't know whether I should have this in or not. <laughs> but it's, it's for your country. I think you what? should. It's for your country, I think you should. I know. <laughs> I was at the officers club and I got a little high. And there was some guy there that, uh, he was a lieutenant commander. And I was just a JG and I went, uh, we were sort of buddies and I went and slapped my hands on his back and said, how is this lieutenant commander with this? I made some remark to him. He got a little bugged. <laughs> And they pulled me off and said, you'd better go back to your room. <laughs> <laughs> then we had another guy. Oh, he was horrible. He was, a, he was a lieutenant from Mississippi. And he had been called back in. And he would get so drunk. that sometimes he'd have to crawl on his hands and knees. 
and he was a he was an alco alcoholic. I found out later, and he'd be drunk, and uh, they could not send him out for what he had, what they had thought he would have duty on. They sent him out to some island, a small island in the Pacific, where there was a post office, and no booze, no nothing. Uh, for his line of duty, for however long it was. <laughs> then there was another guy that uh, he would open a bottle of uh, beer up and on his desk and leave it sit there overnight, and then he'd go into town. And in um, uh, sorry, or in Oregon, they did not have taverns. You had to go to a state office and buy your bottles and take them unopened to the tavern, and they would take the bottles and label them. Hmm. And every time you came in, you got the same bottle. But the only trouble was sometimes they would, the owner would empty them out <laughs> or cut out, take out some of them. I would never have that, but uh, this guy would get drunk and he'd come back and drink that stale beer that was maybe a week stale, and it would sober him up, I guess, or somehow. Ugh. I was glad to get aboard ship, and uh, we left on an LSSL, landing ship support large. It was a small, piddly ship, but it was a, a large landing ship. and. Uh, uh, Astoria, Oregon is about 20 miles inland on the Columbia River and we have to go down it and when you get to where the Columbia runs into the Pacific Ocean it's like you're way down here and the water is way up here and we had to have a pilot take us out because you couldn't and ye gods, here you'd be down and all of a sudden you'd go into the water and up, 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 and then the other side you'd be down. There was the water from the river going out and the water from the, the tide coming in and it, <laughs> and um, they had, uh, when I was, I went, went, went home, at, it was Christmas time, I went home at New Year's and, um, Coming back, we got. Uh, I flew back, and we got to. Um, well, we were going into Chicago, and I thought, "Oh God, I'm going to have to." We they'd had a horrible snowstorm, and I thought we would be stranded at Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. But we came into Midway. That was the only airport, and the taxi cab took me a block and a half from the house. He could not get in into the street. It was snowed in. So I had to plow through a, mile, a block and a half. And uh, Kevin, my youngest son, was sick while I was home. The doctor came out to the house, but he had to park down on 55th Street and walk into where we lived on 53rd. You could, the streets were just not open. And that was when doctors still made home visits. And I understand they're beginning to do that now. And uh, so I got back to a story. Uh, I got back to Portland. And I said, how am I going to get, there was another sailor on the uh, plane with me. And uh, I asked, I said, how are we going to get back to Astoria? He said, I know just the place. When we get off at Portland, we'll go out to this restaurant and sit there and wait. And around midnight, there will be a guy going back to <laughs> Astoria, and we'll all ride with him. He was another Navy man. I said, OK, so I was the only officer. and I. Technically, it was out of place, but to hell with it. I got along better with the uh, enlisted men than I did with the officers, most of them. In World War II, that was true. By the time I got to Korea, uh, in the Korean War, it was a little better. 
I had learned something, but still, I got along better with the enlisted men than the officers. And we got in the car and it was jammed. I was in the front seat. And he, he said, now when we get up in the mountains, it, it was raining in Portland. You're gonna have to roll down the window and scrape the snow off. <laughs> and I, did, I had to because <laughs> it was coming down so bad he couldn't see. The wind, windshield wiper wouldn't take it all off. And then when we got, it was really bad. And when we got going down, the closer we got down to Astoria, the less snow. And the, when we got to uh, Astoria, water was running through the streets. It, it was raining. And I thought, what the hell kind of a country are we in? <laughs> We, we never had anything like that in Illinois. <laughs> it would either be rain or snow, not both. And um, we got, got there and made it. And uh, uh, then uh, we were there for, uh, December, January, February, and uh, till the middle of March, it was St. Patrick's Day about, I think, when we went out to sea, going down to San Diego. And, uh, oh, I sent, I bought boxes of salmon and sent it home. Oh, my mother-in-law and father-in-law and wife loved it. And all, and I kept them happy. And uh, we uh, started out and up, 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 and then boom, down. And uh, we had more people that were seasick. The, well, the boat, ship was small, and it, every bounce of water just took it. And uh, this one guy, I found him laying half asleep. He had vomited halfway up. He was going out to heave up and I had to get another guy to help me bring him up. But they were sick, quite a few. I was, I got over it right away. The first day I was, but whew, after that I was okay. And uh, we were, uh, I don't know how long we were down at San Diego, about a week. And uh, we had, a, we were taking these ships, there was a, about five of them going to Japan, to the Japanese. And uh, we got out to Pearl Harbor, yeah. And then we were there a few days and then we went, headed out to go to Japan. The, there was a fleet of five of us. And we got there and then we broke up. and. Uh, I went to the uh, for the uh, you couldn't call it an off yeah an officer's place you had your bunk and all and but it wasn't fancy uh, like it was in the, on a navy base this was a old Japanese base that the navy had taken over so it didn't have all the fancy things there <laughs> and. Um, I waited about three weeks, almost a month, for to get on uh, LSD, landing ship dock, Fort Marion 22. And they are a repair ship. Instead of, they didn't carry equipment, they repaired the equipment. Instead of like an LST, the bow opened up, you went up on the beach, the bow opened up and the ramp came down and you unloaded your troops and tanks and everything. Uh, with a LSD, it was a bigger ship and it had the same type of open tank, open bottom and all, but it, the, the gates opened from the back. You, uh, if you were where a ship was broken down and it had to be no bigger than a, a destroyer escort, that was the biggest you could take. It had to be, um, you would fill the tanks up with water, 
and the ship would sink. And then you'd open the gates and water would flow in. And when you got it up to a certain level, you could take the ship in and shut the gates and pump it dry and work on it and repair it. Well, luckily we never had to repair anything damaged by, we were out in, we were in Korea and we were out in the ocean about uh, the destroyers and all were going along, the, and they were inland in, on the, near the coast and they were fight, shooting inland and the Koreans were shooting at the ships to try to sink them. And I had two buddies on this one and I thought, oh God, I knew they were there. And uh, I knew, I said, oh boy, the bullets, they were shooting like, this was a ship and you were going this way. There was, uh, the shore was over here. They would be firing. They, they start firing a little ways apart and they start coming in closer and closer and closer and closer until they supposedly hit the ship and then they would bombard it. But this, uh, with this, this guy later, I saw him when we were back in Japan. He said, boy, we were saying our prayers. <laughs> and he said, they came within almost hitting distance. And he said, they stopped. So we were useless. We were about five miles away from them. And if they'd have been hit, we'd have gone in. But And... Uh, I, I was there about a, I was in Japan and Korea about a year and a half and then I came back, but I was gone about two years, I guess, somewhere between a year and a half and two. And uh, when uh, we got back to Japan uh, in, let's see now, 41, 42, and we headed back in 40, Three. No, 53. 53. And we got back to San, uh, uh, what, San Francisco in uh, the spring. And we got uh, discharged and I left San Francisco in May. Yeah. And uh, we got back to uh, Chicago and my wife and baby and my in-laws met me down at the station. And boy, I was glad to be home. But I, I, joined, I found that I said, they're not going to call me in again uh, without me getting money out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, because I had not been active in the reserve. So I went down and became active and I'd go one night a week to play Navy, I said to my wife, <laughs> every Wednesday. And then uh, every so often we'd have a weekend. Every maybe uh, once every four months we'd have a weekend of where you'd have Saturday and Sunday and you'd be home Saturday night and you'd, we'd get up, I'd get up and go to six o'clock mass and then go down there, get down there about eight in the morning. And uh, that was, and you you got paid for those drills, so it was good money. And you had to go on two weeks training duty every year. And uh, I went to one time. I went out to San Francisco, and then I went to uh, to uh, Norfolk, Virginia. One time, a couple of, once or twice, I went down to Key West. Now, that was interesting. We had to go on a, uh, a submarine. Oh, and they were, oh, gods. You'd be in, in a space more crowded than this room. Gee. <laughs> one night, one day, uh, that was enough. <laughs> <laughs> so did you use all the things you learned in, in did you, when you 
when you came back home, did you use any of those things you learned, any of those communications things, anything you've done? No, because I was not at a radio station or anything like that. I did learn to uh, the idea of helping somebody. I came to work one morning. I had been promoted to a supervisor by then. That was in 56, 57, somewhere in there, and pulled into the lot. I got out of the car, and one of my caseworkers was standing about two cars away. When he saw me, he said, Mr. Hawker, this guy has a gun on me. And I thought, oh, my God. I yelled out. I snarled. <laughs> Drop that gun. And it was a kid. It was a teenager. He dropped it and ran. <laughs> <laughs> if it had been an adult, I don't know whether he would have shot me too and this kid or not. I don't know. But this guy ran. And uh, when uh, we walked into the building, when I went to, uh, he was so scared he couldn't open the door. I went to open the door and my hand was shaking. Well, I went in the job and stayed there for about a half hour till I got over it. <laughs> but now that was the only two similar types, one in peacetime, one during war. Mm -hmm. And it was what I learned, what I did aboard ship that I could do for this guy, the same type. That I learned. Uh, what, let's see, what else? Well, yes, I learned, um, I, I, may, I got promoted rather fast. I was working at a public aid office and I knew how to handle papers. I knew how to handle people because I was communications officer on the 1062 then when I got on the 775, I was operations and communications. And then when I got on the uh, LSD, the Fort Marion, I was operations officer. And oh, that, that caused a little trouble. I had been promoted to a lieutenant senior grade, and we were getting ready to move from one place to another and or no we were in port that was it we were in port in japan and uh, i was uh, responsible for assigning uh the officers to their watch so i told the navigator and the navigator never stood watch at sea because he'd have to be up at night and all navigate but during the in port uh and so I assigned him, he said, oh, I can't do it. I'm laying out the uh, plan that we have to follow going to the, back to the States. So I went into the exec and told him, and he looked at me a moment, and he said, how many stripes do you have on that uniform? I said, two. How many does this guy have? And he named him uh, one and a half. You're a senior to him, use those stripes. Now get out of my office. <laughs> and he laughed. And I went and told him, I said, you will take it. <laughs> and he knew he had to. <laughs> um, Did you change your, one of the questions that, um, that I find very interesting is this one. Did your military experience influence your thinking about war or about the military in general? Did it change the way you thought about it? I don't think it changed it. It just emphasized it. I think war is horrible, but sometimes, and in World War II, we needed to be. The Korean War, the way it was run, I. And then I read, oh, who was this doctor that was so famous during the Vietnam War? I have his book at home somewhere. But 
he was from St. Louis and uh, he was a doctor and they called him in and they sent him to Vietnam and he was in the army and oh God's what he went through and he finally died but that that war was they would take a hill the marines and the army would march up and take it and then after they took it they didn't keep it they walked down and gave it back to them that's why one reason well i was a republican anyway but I became a solid one because, and when the, it turned out that Tom, um, Johnson had lied to Congress, that's what got me. And uh, I just became more warlike. <laughs> uh, some of these wars are uncalled for, but the Iraq one and Iraq two were called for, and no matter what they said about either one of the Bushes, I backed them 100%, because Saddam Hussein was butchering people as bad as Hitler and Stalin. You may not agree with me, and I don't care <laughs> what you say, uh, but but you're not going to say anything, are you? <laughs> and uh, the only thing I found fault with with uh, the old Mr. Bush was that he didn't go and take, have the troops take Baghdad. Mm -hmm. Well, he had a good out. They were only supposed to stop them invading Kuwait. That was what the uh, United Nations had said, and he did have their support. So he did what he was supposed to do. But uh, his son couldn't get the support of the United Nations. I, personally, it's as bad as the uh, um, League of Nations was. That was a big flop in the UN is a big flop. They've left um, in Sudan. They have been killing them since 19, at least 1960. The Christians and the pagans, killing them, taking the women into slavery, taking the children, the boys, 12 and 13, making them be in the army, and so on, and killing the rest. For example, the Catholic bishops in Sudan, if they had a meeting, each one would disappear and cross the border and uh, to Uganda and have a place, meeting place, and have their meeting there and then dribble back. Uh, women would be, their they'd see their husbands killed and they'd be drugged into slavery. And finally, in either last year or first part of this year, uh, the United Nations got some idea of what was going on. They ignored it. And the Korean War was, uh, well, but uh, the Iraq War was necessary because they, they didn't find those weapons that uh, Bush had been reported. Uh, uh, he had gotten a report that they were uh, weapons, but they did find graves of hundreds of people, men, women, children, dead, killed and buried. So some wars I'm not in favor of just to have fighting to have fighting. But some wars are necessary. So did you join a veterans group when you came home from I, either war? Or have you ever I did belonged to it? When I was teaching downstate, when I was first, 
when I got through with uh, World War II. But, oh hell, all they did was drink. <laughs> <laughs> they had meetings, but they drank, and I... And did you stay friends with anybody that you were, that you served with at all? Do you still, do you know anybody I, uh, still, or? Yeah, we have a reunion, but I haven't been there for quite some time since I've been up here at, uh, here at St. Andrews. Uh, we had a, I was at a reunion in Virginia in 1991, and I, I, I I've kept in touch, but I haven't been since then. I'm planning on going this time, but I don't know whether I will. Do they still just sit around and drink, or do people talk? Do you, did you talk when you came back from the, from the Second World War and from Korea? Did you talk about you, what you've what done? At home, at home, but not out in public. There was, I know there was people that did, but I just couldn't see it. They'd give speeches in Ballyhoo, and a lot of that was Ballyhoo, I think. <laughs> but no, I did not. And I had a gentleman that I interviewed who had gone to the World War II Memorial, the dedication last summer or last spring. Did you, did, have you ever thought about going there? Where is Seeing it? Seeing it in Washington. Yeah. Oh, I thought they had, that was down in New, New Orleans. Not that I know. I, I don't know. Uh, well, since my wife was killed in an automobile accident, I haven't traveled much at all. I have no desire to. And uh, before she was killed, and I had retired, we traveled quite a bit. We went to, this was in, we went to Washington, D.C., but that was years ago, in the early 90s or 80s. And we went to Maryland and all. We went up to New England. We went to Canada twice. But she would never go west of the Mississippi. And I loved the west, and she loved the east. So I went east. <laughs> well, and you had been there. Had she been? Had she been west? Because you'd been there when you were, when you were serving. You were all up and down the west coast. Oh, I worked there. I worked in the summer, at uh, uh, when I was at college uh, in '47, uh, with the Forest Service. I'd been up and down the east coast and all, but she didn't care to. So we went east. Oh, I hadn't seen much of the east except Boston. <laughs> and, uh, and you didn't like that anyway? Well, in the wintertime, but now in the, by springtime, it was beautiful. Oh, that's good. We were there from January till March or April. And uh, it was nice. I liked Boston. But uh, in the wintertime, you can keep it. <laughs> and uh, we went down to South uh, North Carolina and uh, saw Wrights uh, where they flew the plane, you know, and all. But uh, she liked the East Coast. I liked uh, Washington and Oregon. Just travel through the West. It's fascinating. Were you glad you'd chosen the Navy rather than a different branch of service? Oh, definitely. I would never be in the Army. And the Marines, you can, they're a good a team, but the, the, there's funny rules in the Navy and in the Marines. One is this, the Navy. You can never go into the, uh, uh, you're aboard ship. You can never go into the dining room for officers wearing your guns. The Marines have a rule, they never go anywhere without their guns. And we had, during the Korean War, 